from Millville, New Jersey, and reaching around the world. New Life World Outreach Ministries presents His Word of Power with Pastor Richard F. Myers. Join us in a time of joyful worship, anointed ministry, and dynamic preaching from one of our Sunday morning worship services. It happens here on His Word of Power. Come on, let's just give praise to Jesus. Lord, we lift you up. It's all about you today, Lord Jesus. Amen. on the floor this fire never sleeps this fire never sleeps I see that hope and I I see that hope is coming so pull me from the ashes ignite my soul and please burn away the darkness your love is like a furnace where the fire never sleeps. This fire, this fire never sleeps. This fire never sleeps. Burn all my soul and burn all my soul. Set me on fire. This fire never sleeps, this fire never sleeps, God I never want to miss, God I never want to miss you, something new is being born, and we were born for this, and Lord we know a day is coming, when we look into your eyes, see the fire that never sleeps. This fire never sleeps. This fire never sleeps. Yes, Lord. This fire never sleeps. Burn all my soul and burn all my soul. Send me on fire. This fire never sleeps. This fire never sleeps. Come on, burn on my soul. And burn. This fire never sleeps. This fire never sleeps. This fire never sleeps. This fire never sleeps. God, purify our hearts and purify my heart. Purify my heart and purify my heart. Spirit, fall on us. Spirit, fall.
We worship your name and burn, oh my soul, set me on fire and burn, oh my soul, light up the fire and burn, oh my soul, this fire never sleeps, yes Jesus. This fire never sleeps. This fire never sleeps. This fire never sleeps. This fire never sleeps. Come on, let's praise Him. Come on. Jesus, we lift you up. We ask for your fire to fall in this place today. Lord, we ask for your fire. We ask for your glory to come. Come in this place, O Lord. Come on, let's just raise up our hands. Surrender your hearts to Jesus. Jesus, we lift you up. Come in this place. Come in this place. Yes, Lord. Come on, just lift up your hands and worship him. Oh, we long for you. Touch us with your fire, God. Yes, Lord, we long to see your fire in this place. Oh, yes, Lord, we come longing for you and your presence. Come on, let's just make that our heart cry. Lord, we cry out for your presence. Cry out for your presence. Want to see your kingdom come. from the start of that.
Let's get our Bibles open to James, the fifth chapter. James, the fifth chapter. I want to thank all of you today for braving the weather outside. The roads are clear, but we know that when it snows and, you know, we all get lazy and we all get snow brains. How many know what a snow brain is? That snow brain is that thing that says, I just want to stay in bed the rest of the day. That's a snow brain. It doesn't let your brain function correctly. Amen. Glory. Anybody got any candy? That's an inside joke between me and Brianna. I asked for a piece of candy, and she only had one, and she wouldn't give it to me. She stuck it in her mouth right away, and then she chewed it up right in front of me. <laughs> oh, Lord, have mercy on my soul. I feel good. How, you know, I, in the... In the, in the <laughs> Uh, all right, who did that? Over here. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, bless you. Yeah. In the inimitable words of Mr. James Brown, I feel good. <laughs> <laughs> poor, <laughs> poor Helen here almost had a heart attack on that. Put your hands out towards her and we'll pray for her. She'll be fine. <laughs> She almost passed out on me. James, the fifth chapter. Let's read there at the 16th verse. James, the fifth chapter, the 16th verse. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Let me read that again. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you today for your word. I thank you that the truth of your word is the reality of who you are in us. And that God, when we, you and I together, you and your children together, set themselves in agreement in one accord, then God, you open up the windows for us to be able to be in a position to not only receive from you the blessings that you've bestowed upon us, but you put us in a position to receive the revelation of who we are in you and who you are in us. And so, Father, I thank you today that as we study your word, we will get revelation today and we will understand the power of the word working in us in Jesus' name. I thank you for that in that precious name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, we've been studying temptations. We've been studying how temptations lead us into a place where it produces in us guilt and shame. And we've learned some things about that over the last co couple of weeks as we've been studying about these temptations and their purposes and their intents and what they tried to do to us. And the way that we, or what we found out is the way we get rid of those things is according to God's two-step plan. And God's two-step plan says this, first, confess your sins to him that he may forgive you. <coughs> excuse me, that he may forgive you of your sins, and then secondly, confess your sins one to another. We learn some key things about confessing our sins to one another. We learn that Facebook is not your confession, friend. Please say amen to that. We learn that we don't go and blab our whole lives and everything else on Facebook because you're not going to get any results from that alone. Amen. Amen. And also, what we learned was that we wanted to make sure that when we gave ourselves to someone else, when we spoke to someone else, when we told someone else of the intimacies of our lives, we wanted to make sure that they are someone who has been time-tested with us. They have an investment in us. We have an investment in them. That's why when you are making a confession of some of the struggles of your life, and remember something, and this is really important, the enemy does not want you telling somebody else of the struggles of your life 
because the Bible says if somebody else finds out and the two of you agree, God touches it and the power that the enemy had over you is rendered powerless. So he's going to do everything possible to keep you from exposing those things that he's holding you captive with. But you want to do that with somebody who has been time tested. You know that they can keep your confidence. You know that they'll give you godly advice. You'll know that that person that you have selected is the one who's going to stand with you through the good, the bad, the thick, the thin, the, the beautiful, and the ugly. And I really need to tell you that your next or newest BFF is not your most trusted friend. Hello? For you old people, BFF means best friend forever. Everybody got that now? You know what that means, right? It's not somebody you just met. It's not somebody who just come into your life and all of a sudden, you know, now, you know, they're your best friend, so you're going to tell them everything. If they haven't been time tested, time test them first because it will come back to bite you. They will not be able to be trusted unless you have had a history of investment. And can you remember that, please? A history of investment, a return on your investment. You know, in financial circles, they talk about return on your investment, ROI. And what that means is they look and see what you've invested and what you expect to get in return. You know, when we invest in relationships, there are things that we can expect to get in return. Faithfulness and loyalty and trustworthiness and commitment and a whole bunch of things. And those are the exact people that you want to put your confidence in because they have been time tested and they have a history with you. So we got this plan that God gives us. Two-step plan. First plan, first part of the plan, we confess to God. Second part of the plan, we confess to a trusted, spiritually mature individual who will minister to us where we're at. But it still brings down to the bottom uh, equation of this whole thing, this one question. I know God said, confess your faults to me, and I know he's told me to confess to someone else and have that person pray with me and pray for me and all of those things. I understand that, but why do I even have to confess it in the beginning? Why do I even have to start out with that process? Why do I even have to begin to entrust something that I'm struggling with into somebody else so that they can help me get delivered? Let me make a statement that the Lord gave me to, you know, the other day when I was preparing this, and it really hit home. He said to me these words, and I want to just read what he told me. Unconfessed temptations become activated sin. Well, let me say that again. Unconfessed temptations become activated sin. In other words, what I hold on the inside of me, what I keep secret is in a place in my life that can be watered to multiply it, to develop it, to grow it. So if I'm dealing with something in my life that is not along the lines of what God would have me to deal with, and I don't deal with it the way he told me, confess it to him, confess it to someone else, I've left seeds there that the enemy can come in and begin to water and begin to overcome and overwhelm me with. Why? Because those unconfessed temptations become activated seeds of sin. And I will dwell on them and I will think on them and eventually I will begin to act on them. Can somebody say amen to that? See, because the Bible says in Proverbs, the 28th chapter, the 38th verse, he who covers his sins will not prosper. He who covers his sins will not prosper. And you know what we're seeing right now? What we're seeing here in the United States particularly 
is we're finding out that all of these people who have been committing sins are now being found out and the prosperity that they once had and the power that they once had and the anonymity that they once had is now being exposed and the world is finding out about it from the Hollywood stars all the way down to our politicians or all the way up to our politicians or all the way to the side, however you want to classify them. They're all being exposed for what they've done hidden in darkness. Today, you and I have paid millions and millions of dollars in settlements for our politicians who have committed acts that they should have never committed in the first place, and you and I as taxpayers are paying the settlement cost because that's part of Congress's deal that they pay for a settlement of these sexually abusive charges and all that to quiet them down, cover them over, and go. But look what's happening. God's word is true, and he says you will not prosper, and I will expose you. It doesn't always happen at the timing we'd like, but it will always happen. Somebody say amen. amen. And so what God says is, I'm going to keep you out of the exposure by helping you to confess one to another and to me, and we'll take care of it, and you won't have to be a public display of who you really were. Amen. So now, making a confession to first God and ask his forgiveness, and then confessing to somebody that I trust, somebody that I, I you know, can put my faith into, now becomes much easier because it's the opposite of being public expo publicly exposed for something that I did. So now we know we can't prosper as long as we're holding those things and that we'll eventually be found out. And so I said, okay, Lord, I get all that, and I understand what you're saying. I, I understand that those sinful thoughts, those things that are in me, those temptations that are troubling me, they are seed to become active sin in my life. But what I want to know, Lord, is where do they come from? Why is it happening? I'm trying to serve you. I'm trying to do what you want me to do. I'm trying to be obedient to the best that I can. I'm trying, I'm trying to follow your word. You know, I struggle in areas of my life, but I'm trying my hardest. Why am I going through this? I have no idea. He must be some vile person, I guess. I don't know. No, because it rains on the just and the unjust. You can be the best Christian in the world and you're going to get tempted and you're going to have struggles and you're going to have battles and you're going to have to power through them. The person sitting next to you is just as vile as you used to be. The person sitting behind you is worse than the person sitting in front of you. So look around and decide where you want to move to because the person there, you know, you see what I'm saying? We get this idea and the devil lies to us and tells us you're the only person doing that. You're the evil, vile one. I'm going to tell you something. She's more vile than I am. I love you. you do. Yeah. She's not really, huh? I'm the vile one in the house. See, I'm in trouble now. I don't know where to go, what to do. Flowers, Flowers don't work well in my house. Diamonds and chocolate. So I said, Lord, I don't get this. And he said, the same, listen to this now, the same sinful thoughts that you have originate from the same sinful deeds that the enemy wants you to create or wants you to do. See, the reason God wants us to confess these first to him and then one to another is that's God's spiritual way of spiritually disposing of these things before they get planted and take root in your life. 
And so the moment I say to my wife, honey, I'm going through a tough time right now. I'm doing this, I'm having this, I'm struggling with this. I have not only exposed him, but I've gotten her to set herself in agreement with me, and we're going to get the victory because if any two of you agree and touch anything, which we've just now done, plus she's going to keep her eye on me and help me when that struggle comes up and will keep me from stepping into that place where the thoughts and the deeds originate from. See, the moment I start thinking something, I have the possibility of becoming that. Let me say that again. The moment I begin thinking something is the moment that I have the possibility of becoming that. Because if I can think it, I can do it. If I can think a good thing, I can do it. If I think a bad thing, I can do it. If I think I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus and stand on that, I can be healed by the stripes of Jesus. If I think I'm going to do this or I think I'm going to do that, I can become those things because the Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So those things that dominate our thoughts, those temptations that control us, man, they overwhelm us. I just read this this morning in the Word of God in Matthew, the fifth chapter, 28th verse, says this, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in her heart. What is he saying there? He's saying, as a man thinketh, so does he become. So when it's lust, sexual lust, or power lust, or money lust, or whatever, hap whatever it happens to be, once we begin to start thinking it, once it becomes part of our thought process, we enter into the battlegrounds of our mind. And in the battlegrounds of our mind is where every one of us have our biggest struggles. It's really not in what happens to us. You know, we have people here. Uh, where's, where's Don Pio at? Don Pio is fighting cancer. It's not the cancer. It's what he's going to believe and what he's going to stand on and what we set ourselves in agreement with him that will make the difference. Please say amen to that. Amen. You know, it's not the disease that it will kill us. It's what we believe God for and are able to stand against. Because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So I'll tell you something. I walk around all the time saying I'm blessed, I'm prosperous, I'm good looking. You know, I say those things all the time because one day they will come to pass. I need an amen right there. I'm not going any further and you're going to sit in silence for the next 35 minutes till I hear a big amen. Thank you. You see, you get this? Here's, 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 here's what I want us to get. You act upon the things you think upon. You act upon the things you think upon. Let me say that again. You act upon the things you think upon. Whatever is trafficking in your mind consistently is the very things that you'll wind up doing because a man, as a man thinketh, so is he. You become what you dwell on. That's why it's so important, and that's why God says when these temptations, when these struggles, when these battles, when these things come against you, dispose of them quickly because once they start taking root in you, the battles increase. The level of battle increases proportionately to the amount of root that the seed has inside of you. So the battles increase as that which you are thinking about all the time controls you. I've noticed over the years there's times when we're going through a particular battle or a particular struggle. Anybody here ever going through a battle or a struggle? Or am I just talking to me? Okay. You ever notice what happens to you? Let's say you're in a financial tough time right now. You ever notice that when you wake up at night what you're thinking about? You ever notice what you went to bed thinking about? You ever notice what happened during the day? What you were thinking about? You ever notice when you reach in your pocket and there's nothing there what you're thinking about? 
Because what happens is this stuff gets running on a loop in your brain, you know, and you try to put it down and it loops and you try to get rid of it and it loops. And it loops and loops and loops, and you, it is hard to break that thing on your own because it gets a hold of you and it becomes a recurring thought over and over and over, and there's a reason for that. Your mind will not let it go until you take an action to let it go. Once something gets locked in the loop of your mind, there is only one way to get rid of it. For the answer to that is my new book out, which it says, Stop the Loop. No. Listen, listen, listen. You go to sleep at night, and you're in a battle, and that thing's looping in your brain, and you start thinking of all the things that you got to do. Stop thinking, get up, write it on a pad, and go back to sleep, and you will go to sleep. Do you know why? Because you've released it from the loop of your mind. Now watch. There's some times when we're having a really busy week here at church, all the things that I've got to do that week start running in my mind. Anybody ever have that? Christmas time. How many are thinking already of all the things you got to do before Christmas? How many of you men are thinking about all the diamonds, chocolates, and flowers you got to run out and get for your wives before? Not one hand went up. Uh, you're probably like me. You thought about it and said, nah, forget that. Uh, I'm getting her a blender. <laughs> Starts looping in your mind, and you start thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking about it. And it controls your thoughts. If you get up and you write it down, now watch this. That's very simple to do when it's something like, what you have to do during the week, the Christmas gifts you got to buy, the food you got to get from the shopping market because you're having the whole family and the pastor and his family over for dinner for Christmas. Amen. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, just, I just heard Abraham say amen, and I just saw Lizette say, shut up. <laughs> See, it works for looping when you're thinking about what you got to prepare for dinners or get ready for the party or blah, 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 blah. But what when it's a sinful temptation? The same thing happens. The moment I confess it to someone that I have entrusted and have a history with, I can release it from my brain and it no longer has the power to traffic in me. Somebody say amen. So you know what spiritual confession becomes? It becomes the writing down of that thing that your mind has been looping for the last few months or years or whatever it is, and you no longer have to be controlled by it because now the darkness of that thing has been exposed and you have now stepped into light. And let me tell you something, sin, uh, temptations, all that junk from the enemy has to operate in darkness. It cannot operate in the light. So the moment you put light on anything in your life that, not, that doesn't line up with God and his word for you, the moment you do that, it renders it powerless because evil cannot operate in light. It must have darkness to cover its intentions. So now I have great motivation to go and tell my trusted friend, tell my spouse, tell somebody that's spiritually mature. I have great motivation now to go talk to them and tell them what I'm struggling through because when I do that, I stop the trafficking of my mind, number one, and I render it powerless because I've exposed it in the light. Somebody say amen. 
In fact, listen to this from Isaiah, the 42nd chapter. It says this, I will lead the blind by ways which they have known along unfamiliar paths. I will guide them. I will turn the darkness into light before them and make the rough places smooth. I will make the rough places smooth. So what happens is this. Like when I write down that list of stuff that I got to do, instead of trying to hold it in my mind and think about it all night long and not get any sleep, the moment I make that confession, I've rendered that attack powerless and I've released the looping of it in my mind. I'm no longer thinking it. I'm no longer becoming it. Somebody say amen. And so I've learned that it's not easy to do but it's worthwhile to do. I know over the years, different, different battles that we've been in, there's been times when I've had to go to Helen and say, you know, I'm really struggling over this, or I, I'm feeling like I'm getting attacked in this area. You know, and I'll be honest with you guys, us macho men don't like to do that. We got this control. We got, we got this under control. No, we don't. We don't have it under control. We think we do, we don't. You let some pretty little thing come upside you and start flirting with you, you may think you got it under control, you ain't got it. You ain't got it. Trust me, you ain't got it. I know that's bad grammar, but you ain't got it. You think you can handle it? You can't handle it because all of a sudden your ego starts getting puffed up, your pride starts getting puffed up, you start seeing yourself a little bit better than you really are because you really are nothing but one ugly dude. But this woman came up and she saw something in you that, you know, she needed and so she sapped in. Now you go tell your wife, no, I ain't told my wife, you know, I ain't told my wife to such and such and such and such and whoo, 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 is, is, you know, interested in me. I, no, I ain't told, you better, Jack. Because she's going to find out. Amen. And if you go and say, look, I'm being tempted here, she's going to keep her eye on you, and then you're going to stay out of trouble because that's a better deal than the other way. Amen. we got to learn, guys, that it's not easy to confess our faults one to another, but it works. Please say amen. amen. And so what I found out as we've been studying this I found out something that was great revelation to me this morning. Well, actually, I found it out when I was doing my notes for this, but as I was reading the notes over again, God really spoke to me. And he said, you know something? He said, most of my, my children get this whole thing wrong. He said, most of my children think that the devil comes along with his devices to get us to sin. And he said, that's not correct. I said, wait a minute. He's the author of, of sin. He's the author of evil. What do you mean he doesn't come along to tempt us to do wrong? No, he doesn't tempt you to do wrong. What he tempts you to do is surrender your position in me. Well, let me say that again, because that's a powerful statement. What, the, what God said to me this morning is, the enemy does not tempt us to do wrong. He tempts us to lose what God has already put into us. So the moment I became saved, and this is how God explained it to me, the moment I became saved, the moment I gave my heart to God, and I wrote these extra notes here, that once we're born again, what happens is I can't be tempted by the sin nature that I used to have. When I got born again, that old sin nature got washed away. You've heard the scripture. Behold, all things become new. I'm a new creature in Christ. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. I don't have a sin nature anymore. So he can't tempt that sin nature in me anymore like he used to be able to do. What he does is he comes in and gives me suggestions and ideas and temptations to make me surrender my privileges as a child of God. In other words, what he does is I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. What he's going to tempt me with is that's not for you. 
That went out with the apostles. You're not worthy enough to receive healing. You remember what you did back here? Remember what you did over there? Remember you told somebody this the other day? You're not worthy. You're not entitled to that anymore. See, what he's trying to do is not tempt me to fall into sin, but he's tempting me to surrender my rights to healing, to deliverance, to prosperity, to relationship, to marriage, to whatever it is. He's causing me to try to surrender those things and give them up because we know of his devices. We know he comes in to try to get us to fail and falter. But what we've got to get a hold of is that he comes to tempt us to shift our point of view. Every one of us in this building has struggled with our own worth before God. Every one of us in this building have questioned ourselves. Why aren't I getting healed? Why aren't I getting blessed? Why don't I have a man? Why don't I have a woman? Why don't, why don't? How come, how come, how come? See, what the enemy has convinced us in, that that privilege of healing or relationship or, or promise of prosperity, what he's convinced us in is that that's not for you. That may be for her or that may be for him over there, but that's not for you because you did this or you're not doing that or you don't read your Bible enough or you don't da-da-da-da-da. And so what he's got us to do is to change our point of view of who we are in Christ, surrendering our position in Christ. When I got saved, when you got saved, everything was a completed work in us. Somebody say amen, please. We're healed, we're delivered, we're set free, we're, we're blessed, we have prosperity. God said those are all the bread of the children. So what happens? The enemy comes along and says, yeah, well, it's, it, you, it, you know, many of the, his children are entitled to that, but, 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 but not, not you. you, you're not. So it comes to do this. It comes to shift our point of view and make us, instead of a believer on the firm authority of the word of God, he helps us create an opinion. I can't tell you the number of people that sit in my office and talk to me over the years that I've been in ministry that have told me, well, you know, I, I just don't think I'm worthy to be used by God. Well, you know, I, I just don't think that God could use me, not, not the person I am, not the way that I've become, not, not the things that I've done. Are you born again? Yeah, I, I accepted Christ. Well, then God can use you. No, I, I don't think so. Uh, you know, when I, when I sit next to such and such, you know, I can see the glory of God on them. I can see they love God. But, you know, for me, I, he's created an opinion. And the moment the enemy can create an opinion in you so that you form an opinion, and this temptation comes to create that, then he can tell you you're not entitled to that anymore. That, that's not for you. You're ineligible for that, or even you're unfit for that. You, you know, you can't do that anymore. And see, what's happened is he hasn't come to cause us to sin. He's come to steal away the rights and privileges that have been granted to you as a believer. Makes sense now, doesn't it, when the Word of God says, the thief cometh but to kill, rob, steal, and destroy. Doesn't say there he comes to tempt. Doesn't say there he comes to push us into sin. Doesn't say there he tries to lead us down the path of unrighteousness. It says he comes to kill, rob, steal, and destroy. What's he stealing? What's he robbing? What's he destroying? The promises, the covenant, and the position that you and I have in Christ once we've said, I receive you, Jesus, as my personal Lord and Savior. Please say amen. And see, reason why he gets you to form an opinion, because listen to this, 
opinions are perspectives based on influence, circumstances, and situations. So in other words, I'm going to have an opinion based on what I've been exposed to, the environment that I've lived in. You know, I used to have this example in one of the messages that I preached, and it was about a three-legged dog. And it was this. Here's the example. If Tony and I ever saw a three-legged dog, and we both came from different situations, different environments, and different circumstances, we would have a different opinion on that three-legged dog. If she had never seen a four-legged dog because where she lived, there was only a three-legged dog, she would think that that dog was perfectly normal. And I would not be able to convince her any other way because her opinion is that I've always seen a three-legged dog. That's the way it's supposed to look but I've seen a four-legged dog. So I know the three-legged dog that she says is an anomaly, and what I've seen is true because I've seen more four-legged dogs than she's seen three-legged dogs. How many of you know dogs have five legs? <laughs> See, it's all based on perspective. It's all based on your situations. And so when the devil can move away or move you away from what God's Word says into your own opinion or the opinions of others, the power of who you are, your position in him, and the truth of God's Word becomes diluted. And any time you dilute or pollute the purity, you paralyze the power. Any time you dilute or pollute the purity of anything, then you paralyze the power. And so you have no doubt whatsoever God's Word is the literal translation of His intention. Amen. When He said, you are healed by the stripes of Jesus, don't surrender that. When he said, when you're obedient, you'll eat of the good of the land, don't surrender that. When he said, you will walk in relationships that will be a blessing, don't surrender that. When he said, you and your family shall prosper. When he said, believe on me and you and your household will be saved, don't surrender it. When he said, you will walk uprightly before me, don't surrender that. Amen. The temptations that come in your life are only designed to cause you to surrender your position, your privileges, and your promises so that you become like anybody else and never get the fullness of being a child of the living God. Turn to someone this morning and tell them, you're a child of God. Don't surrender your privileges. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hey, excuse me just a minute. Uh, Brianna. I got candy, and you ain't, you, and it's a baby Ruth, and you ain't getting even a bite. I ain't even gonna let you smell the rock. Mm. Praise God. How many learned something this morning? How many are gonna fight the devil now? You're not gonna let him take your privileges. You're a child of the living God. He's not causing you to sin. He's causing you to relinquish your rights and your privileges and your promises, and you will not do it. Father, <coughs> in the name of Jesus, I thank you, God. He's just been exposed. I thank you, God, that we are under now the truth of your word, and we understand that he can't tempt us into sin. He can only tempt us to surrender our rights, our privileges, and the promises you've given us as a born-again, brand-new believer. And I thank you today, God, that those old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new in me. And in all who proclaim 
Jesus Christ is Lord. So Father, take that which we have shared today from your heart to their heart, translate it to understanding and revelation that God, they may know without a shadow of a doubt, they are the true and living children of the most high God. I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Woo, glory. Hallelujah. Your head is bowed. Your eyes are closed. Is there somebody here this morning you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life? Is there someone here this morning that you want to meet Jesus for the first time or that you want to rededicate your life and you want to come back and have that relationship and regain your rights and privileges as a child of the Most High God? Are you here this morning and you're ready to make a decision and proclaim Jesus is the Son of God and I need Him in my life to help me live victorious. If you're here right now, I'm praying one final prayer before we dismiss this service. If you want to be included in that prayer, if you want to be part of the family of the living God, you want to rededicate your life or you want to meet Jesus for the first time, and you want us to pray with you, I'll give you a Bible, we'll pray over you, and you will have the privileges, the rights, and the promises that God has said he has reserved for his children. All you got to do is let me know you want to be in this final prayer. So if you're here right where you are, and you've never asked Jesus to be Lord and Savior of your life, or you have, but you kind of got detoured and you're ready to come back, would you slip your hand up right now quickly? And I'll include you. Thank you. Who else? Somebody else, quickly. Thank you. Who else? Someone else, quickly, this morning. This is your day. You want to make Jesus the Lord of your life? You want to rededicate your life to him? A counselor is coming to you right now. They're going to pray with you. Someone else, quickly. Anyone else this morning? This is your day. Man, this is the day we've all waited for, for you to be a child of the living God. Anyone else? Father, I thank you today that these lives today have been touched by your Holy Spirit. And today they make the commitment to receive you or rededicate their lives to you. And we rejoice, Father, that they are now into the ark of safety and they are now endued with power from on high and are encased with all the privileges, the promises, and the rights of a child of the living God. We welcome them into the family of faith through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen and amen. Let's welcome them into the family. Stand up to your feet with me. Hi, this is Pastor Myers. I wanted to let you know our church family would love to have you join us here in the sanctuary for one of our weekly services. Every Sunday morning we have dynamic worship, powerful preaching, an awesome children's church, and we see the power of God as he ministers to his family. Those services begin at 11 a.m. Then on Wednesday nights, we have ministries for the entire family. We have adult worship and Bible study. Royal Rangers for the boys and G3 for the girls. It's a night packed with the presence and power of God and it happens at 7.15 every Wednesday evening. If you'd like more information about New Life Church, you can go to our website at newlifeoutreach.org. There you'll find all the information you need to be part of a great church. Well, until our family meets your family on our next broadcast, may God richly bless you and yours. We've been here for 27 years, Helen and I. Uh, we came in 1986. 23 years. 32 years. It's either 10 or 11 years, I think. For 12 years. Uh, 22 years. 26 years. 26 and a half years. 
There were times when you hear the echoes in the building because of the lack of people. We had about 70 people and a whole lot of debt. Um, it was a little bit different than other churches that I've been to. Uh, got stretched a lot in the beginning. <laughs> the prayer pants were still here. It's a wild pastor that would dance all over the pews and jump from pew to pew. We had no TV ministry back then. Oh man, I was scared, man. <laughs> I was scared, bro. I was nervous. I didn't know what to expect. Wade Keller around the table at ministry. We've grown from 70 families to about 500 uh, members now. I'm stretching. Much spiritual growth, a real impartation. Uh, change, growth, and more stretching. We've seen tremendous moves of the Holy Spirit. We've seen God do amazing things. So we saw a great growth spurt. Uh, we've teamed up our missions uh, programs with Apostle Roseman Romney in the Caribbean and Dr. Mike Panjo in Ohio. I felt like I was accepted where I was at each stage of my life. And some stretching. We're at a paradigm shift right now. And now God is bringing us to a new realm where he's asking us to be a door for people to come and find him. It's exciting, an exciting time. You see, you know, people growing to the place where they can step into their ministries. We've got this new element that we want to accept you where you are and value where you are and who you are and then love you enough to take you to a higher place. There's a, 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 a renewed fire, it's growing. And, and like I said, there's an expectancy here. It, and it's curiosity, but in a good way. Now you see the growth of the people that's coming in the house of worship, and that's a blessing in, in itself. There's a strong message of the Father's love and the grace of God coming forth. That's a question that we really uh, had to ask ourselves, because so many churches you know, claim special things. People gravitate here of different backgrounds and races. The freshness, it's not um, starchy, it's not religious always alive and, and exciting. very cutting edge. We worship hard, man. It's bringing people from everywhere. The church is the most segregated place. We were the only church in this entire community that was multiracial. And I just love what I see and sense and, and it's beautiful.